Okay, thanks very much to Joanne, Yen, and Gina for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So I'll be talking a bit about how we've been using deep learning to try to gain some physical insights into structure formation. And I apologize to those that were at the CCA workshop if they heard this talk before. Um, okay, so let me just start with, you know, machine learning has now become a very traditional approach in many applications of astronomy. It goes back to classifications of stars, uh, data compression problems, as well as model emulation and, and all sorts of applications where it's now become the traditional method um, in those fields. So what we've been trying to do is to see whether we can use machine learning to actually extract new physics, new physical insights by studying how machine learning uh, works. So we have you know, a method that is able to learn nonlinear mappings. Can we actually learn something new about the physics of a given problem by learning how um, the model uh, learns? So I've been applying this to cosmological structure formation. So as all of you know, the today's large scale structure is basically a cosmic web where you have um, dark matter halos that are connected by filaments and then surrounded by large voids. And all of this complicated large scale structure comes from tiny perturbations in the density of matter at early times that evolve through nonlinear gravitational evolution to form today's large scale structure. So the kind of questions that I'm interested in is how can we build a physical model of structure formation uh, given this very complicated nonlinear dynamics um, that lead the formation of structures? So how can we understand how properties of large scale structures uh, emerge? Why do we observe universal properties across a wide range of redshifts and, and masses? Um, so how can we compress all the information that there is in this nonlinear gravitational evolution into a simple theoretical understanding of structure formation? So I've been focusing um, mainly on dark matter halos. So in this case, we have you know, the, the most accurate method that we have to model the formation of, of dark matter halos is through n-body simulation. So with n-body simulations, you start off um, at early times when, when the universe was linear and the density field is very well approximated just by a Gaussian random field. And then in the n-body simulations, you basically just have all the ingredients, so gravity, um, to evolve this initial density field into the nonlinear um, density field at redshift zero, where we um, call the most overdense regions in the density field, we call those dark matter halos. So though n-body simulations have all the ingredients to make this mapping from the initial conditions to today's um, dark matter halos, they're, they're, they are hard to interpret physically. So it's hard to know just from n-body simulations alone, what are the properties of the initial density field that determine dark matter halos and, and their properties. So on the other hand, we have analytic models that although they can provide a qualitative understanding of, of halo formations, they are limited by um, the, the limitations in the, in the model complexity that one can form analytically. So what we've been trying to do is to say, okay, well, can we train a machine learning algorithm to learn the mapping from the initial conditions um, to the dark matter halos uh, in n-body simulations. And we want to use this, this machine learning model, not so much as an n-body surrogate or to create a fast mapping between initial conditions and final halos, but actually to try and understand more about halo formation, to try and understand more, what are the properties of the initial density field um, that lead to the formation of dark matter halos. Okay, so how do we actually set up with this machine learning problem? So in n-body simulations, you start off, as I said, from your initial conditions density field, which is just a realization of a Gaussian random field with the correct power spectrum from our cosmological model. And then, as I said, the n-body simulation has all the ingredients 
to evolve this, this density field to today's large scale structure. And then from the end body stimulation, we can um, look at the dark matter halos that have formed and pick out some of their properties. So in this case, we focused on the mass of dark matter halos just because it's the primary characteristic of halos, but it can be generalized to any other um, halo property. So what we want to do is then to construct a 3D convolutional neural network that takes in as input um, the same raw initial conditions density field as that used by the M-body simulation and predict the final halo masses that result from gravitational evolution. And I want to stress that, you know, the, the CNN here is not intended to learn something like gravity, but it's just intended to extract whatever information content it can find in the initial conditions only about halo mass. Now, of course, for a single realization of the initial conditions, there are many, many different halos within one simulation and many different halo masses. So what we do is that we actually construct this mapping for um, on a particle by particle basis. So for every particle in the n-body simulation, we can look at what halo it belongs to at redshift zero. So for every halo that ends up in a uh, for every particle that ends up in a halo, we can trace that particle back to its location in the initial conditions. And then the input to the convolution neural network is basically a subregion of the initial conditions centered on the particle's position. Um, and that basically captures the environment around which the, the particle lives in the initial conditions. So the input is basically the initial density field centered on a particle's position. And the output is the mass of the halo to which that particle will end up in a redshift zero. So stop me if anything is unclear, but basically you have for every particle a map in between the, its initial region, like a subbox um, around that given particle, and the label is the mass of the halo where that particle ends up at redshift zero. And then you can the do, box? yeah. How big is the box, the little box? So the box is basically, uh, has a length of 15 megaparsecs over H. One five? Yeah, yeah. Um, so essentially you can create this mapping um, for many different particles of, uh, across many different simulations, which are different realizations of the initial condition density field. So, and, and train uh, the neural network on these different examples of dark matter particles. So that the aim is basically for the model to identify which aspects of the initial density field become relevant to predict um, the final halo masses. Okay, so why are we actually using convolutional neural networks in the first place? And the reason is that convolutional neural networks have the nice properties that they don't need to, um, they don't require featureization. So typically with most machine learning models, you need to do some data compression to extract the relevant features from your data to then use as inputs to your uh, machine learning model. Now with CNNs, you don't need to do this. And so what we can do is like we can feed in this initial conditions raw data so that the, it's the CNN itself that actually learns what are the relevant features in the initial conditions to predict halo mass. Um, now the disadvantages is that CNNs are known as black, bo black box algorithms. So they're typically uh, very complicated um, neural networks that are quite hard to interpret. It's so hard to understand what information they're actually using to make their predictions. Um, so how can we actually extract physical knowledge from a deep learning algorithm if it's a black box in this sense? Okay, so first let's look at what the CNN model actually looks like. So at least in the machine learning community, it's, it's a fairly simple neural network. So it has six convolutional layers where basically the aim is to extract features. So as I said, the input gets convolved at every convolutional layer with a set of kernels, and each kernel is supposed to detect a specific features. 
So then by stacking uh, these convolutional layers, you're basically um, detecting low level um, local features in the first layers and then more higher level abstract features in later layers. And then um, after this feature extraction part, you have uh, two fully connected layers, which basically um, combine these features together to give you your final halo mass prediction. And the most important layer here is really this convolutional layer that does this feature extraction process. So I just wanted to show in more detail what this convolution layer does. It basically involves a kernel, which has a set of free parameters. Now in this um, cartoon, it's in 2D, but because our inputs are in 3D, we actually do a 3D um, convolutional um, layers. So you have basically a kernel that moves across the input and every time it generates a dot product with the overlapping region of your input. So the output uh, is basically the dot product between your values of your kernel um, and the region of the input that uh, is overlapping with it every time. Now there's a number of um, free parameters and choices that you have to make when you set up this model and these involves how you make um, how you let this convolutional um, process actually happen. For example, you can pad your inputs uh, with zero so that your kernel is always centered on, on, the, on every pixel of your input. You can choose different sizes for your kernels. And so, you know, you have to go through a process of, of trial and error of cross-validation to test what are uh, the best choices of hyperparameters um, that work for your model. So uh, once you've set up uh, your model, the, the, the question. yeah. If we go back to the previous uh, uh, slide, there were a bunch of uh, numbers on the top where it says 32, three cube. Can you tell yeah. the three cube probably the size of the thing, but this means you're using 32 of them. Can you tell us what those numbers are? Right, yeah. So the three cubed is the size of the kernel. So remember that this is in 3D because our input is 3D. So the kernel is a three uh, cube matrix and 32 is the number of kernels. So this basically sets how many features you detect in a single layer. So it's typical to basically go um, deeper in your network so that at first you have a lower number of kernels because you have a very high dimensional uh, input and then as you stack more and more layers, you increase your number of kernels. So basically these numbers are the number of kernels and the size of the kernel. And what is this max pool in the middle? So the max pooling is basically a layer that decreases uh, the dimensionality of your of the output of the convolutional layer. So the convolutional layer has an output that's like a matrix like this. And then this max pooling basically takes the maximum value within some region. So it can be a two cubes or some small region of your output. You just take the maximum value so that you reduce the dimensionality of your um, problem. Now, it, 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 you made a lot of choices. How difficult was it? I mean, because of all these numbers. Is this yeah. a thing or you had to go a long time to figure this out? Or? Yeah, this, this, this takes ages of, you know, trial and error in the sense that, I mean, of course, the, the community has now some established choices that seem to work better than others, but it's true that they're typically tested on images. So then when you try to apply those, you know, standard rules that pe people typically use to, at least for us, to this cosmological settings, a lot of things worked in a different way. So yeah, you have to go through this process of trying these different hyper and some things don't make a difference, uh, but others definitely do. Thank you. Yeah. So the next step is once you've set up what your model should look like is to actually train uh, your CNN. So this basically means finding the set of parameters so it's, it's mainly the parameters of your kernels that I was just showing you that minimize a loss function. So for the loss function, you can think of this in, in, in Bayesian terms. 
um, where the first term is basically your likelihood term. So this tells you about um, the, the, the difference between your data, which is in, in this case, the true labels of, of halo masses and those resulting from your model, which are the predicted halo masses from the, your, 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 uh, your neural network. And so here you have to make a choice of a likelihood and typically people choose something like a Gaussian likelihood that give rise to the typical mean squared error loss function. For us, we found that a Gaussian likelihood didn't, didn't describe the data well, but instead a Cauchy likelihood that has some fatter, fatter tails than, than a Gaussian works much better. So this uh, predictive term is basically the negative log of a Cauchy likelihood. And then the second term is a regularization term, or you can think of this as a prior over the weights, as a prior over the, the, the kernel parameters. And here we choose some priors that basically help with regularizing the network. So to try to reduce overfitting and that also can compress the model to the least number of, um, of parameters. Okay, so once you've actually trained the neural network on all those examples of um, dark matter particles from the different simulations, you can then take your trained neural network and test it on dark matter particles from independent simulations. So again, for each particle, the input is this subbox region around its location in the initial conditions and its label uh, is the mass of the halo to which that particle will end up in a redshift zero. So then you can compare the predictions against the ground truth. And this is what is shown here in this right panel. So on the y-axis, you have the predicted masses and on the true, uh, on the x-axis, you have the true halo masses. And these are plotted as the distribution of predicted masses in bins of true mass. And what you can see is that these predictions have quite a large variance. So they have quite a large variance, they're quite skewed, but that more or less the maximum posterior of these distributions is in the correct location, which is in this y equal x line here. So the question is, okay, what, what information is the algorithm learning that leads to this quite large uh, variance in the predictions? So um, what we do is that we try to develop a, a simple and, and I think effective interpretability technique to try and understand uh, what information has the CNN learned to predict halo masses. So the technique is really simple. What you do is that you remove part of the information carried by the input, then you retrain the model and then you measure the resulting change in the model's performance. So by removing part of the information, you can test whether that information that you removed had relevant information to, to predict your final output. So in this case, what we do is that we want, we removed inisotropic information from the initial density field. This is because we wanted to test what is the role of anisotropic information compared to isotropic information, which is a very established um, set of properties in the initial conditions from the spherical collapse model. So we wanted to test, okay, what is actually the role of anisotropic information uh, in the initial density field in predicting final halo masses? So basically from our 3D uh, boxes that, are, that were the inputs to the CNN, we take the average um, over shells around the center, which again is the particle's position uh, in the initial conditions. So by taking the average density over shells, we basically get rid of all the information about the anisotropies in the initial density field. So then we have two CNN models, one that is based on the raw density like all the information in the initial conditions and one that is only based on average densities uh, around the particles positions. So then we measure the, the, the change in the model's performance as a result of, of this removal of information. So in this lower panel here, I'm showing you basically the residuals. So the predicted uh, divided by the true halo masses for the two models, the one, 
trained on all the information in the, in the density field and one where we only include the average density around the dark matter particle. And the three panels basically show the residuals in three different mass bins uh, of halos. And what we find is that despite some visual differences between these, dif these distributions, actually these models are fully consistent. So removing information about the anisotropies in the initial density field has very little impact um, in, the, in the final predictions of the neural network. So what this means is that the CNN has basically learned uh, information that is equivalent to spherical averages over the initial conditions and that the anisotropic information plays very little role in establishing final halo masses. So one crucial uh, assumption that we make in, in, in making this conclusion is that we are assuming that the CNN is able to extract the features from the smaller scales to the larger scales within the input subboxes that we're giving in. So to test this assumption, we basically try to come up with a problem that is as close as, as the, the real problem that we're tackling, but where we already know the answer so that we can compare um, the machine learning predictions with, with the known answer. So what we did is that instead of training the CNN on the initial density field, we train it on the present day nonlinear density field. So here we know that all the information is there to predict halo masses. We know that basically what the CNN has to learn is, is what we is, is the equivalent of the of the halo finder algorithm, right? That um, gives you a, a mass. We didn't do this connection here. Is it still working in your laptop? Hmm? Is it still working in your laptop? What you... No, no, she's frozen. Not yeah, I think she's frozen for everybody. Right? Yeah, or everybody. So maybe, maybe Louisa lost the connection. We only can only wait. I think. Yeah, maybe. Oh well, yeah, maybe we can send a message to to me. Uh, let me send. Uh... Did my connection just oh. die, or was yes. it just? Uh, it died for uh, like. Roughly one minute, yes. Oh no, okay. But no problem. Uh, we. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. We have plenty of time, so. Did you um, hear anything about this slide? That was the slide, the last one we saw. Okay. So what what I was saying here is basically that we're trying to test the ability of the CNN to extract features on all scales probed by our input subbox. So this means extracting features on the smallest scales up to the very largest scales. And this is important if we want to trust our neural network to be able to extract information when there is there. So what we did in this test was basically to train the CNN instead of from the initial conditions density field train it on the present day nonlinear density field. So in this case, we know that the, all the information is there. We know that what the CNN has to learn is basically our halo finder algorithm that predicts a mass from the redshift zero density field. And so what we find is in fact that the CNN can give you perfect, perfect predictions, meaning that our CNN architecture is suitable to extract by its convolutional layers features on the smaller scales up to the larger scales which are needed to predict the mass of the smallest of the smallest halos here and the largest ones over here okay so what i've basically shown you up to now is that 
we used an interpretability technique that was very helpful to test the hypothesis. So we needed a hypothesis to start with, which was, okay, what is the role of anisotropic information in predicting halo masses? And by removing that information and measuring the change in the model's predictions, we've, we were able to infer uh, what information is, is the CNN learning from the initial conditions. So now the question is, can we actually go beyond testing known hypothesis of structure formation and try to extract new knowledge from neural networks? So of course, that there's many ways to do this. And what we're trying to do is to use basically a data compression um, techniques. So compress the relevant information in your, in your data into a low dimensional representation, and then try to interpret this low dimensional representation uh, with respect to physical uh, properties of, of your inputs or of the logical structure. So um, this is just showing you some work in progress, like related to, to this concept. So um, here, the setting is slightly different. So whereas before we were training on the initial conditions and predicting halo masses, now we train. So our input is the nonlinear density field. So the evolved density field, the redshift zero around a given dark matter halo. And the output is the radial density profile of that halo. And the idea is to combine basically convolutional neural networks and variational order encoders for those that know what they are to try to compress the information in the nonlinear density field into this latent uh, representation, which is just a low dimensional representation that should encode the most relevant aspects of the halos in a structure in order to then predict its density profile. So you can think of this a bit like a nonlinear PCA, right? It's just a nonlinear compression. And by basically compressing the information in this low dimensional space, we hope to be able to interpret this better with respect to um, the physical properties of the density field, for example. So in this case that we're trying to predict the density profile, how do we ensure that this latent space actually encodes um, information about the halos in a structure? And we do this basically by adding an input here to the second part of the neural network. This is this log of R here. So that basically the role of the second part of the neural network is to say, what is the density at any given radius r? So you'd be able to basically predict the density at any given r as, as given by the input, just seeing this representation. And so this basically what it allows us to constrain the representation to encode aspects of the halos in a structure, because it's then able to give you a prediction for any given radius um from from the center of the halo so it's basically trying to do a dimension a dimensional reduction to extract knowledge from the neural network about what is the most relevant aspects of in this case the halo's inner structure and how does the neural network parameterize that was there a question yeah there was a question i, I, I was wondering uh sorry um for the application of these um you're feeding the nonlinear density field that has the halo there. So why don't you just uh, measure the profile? I didn't right. get that. Yeah, so the idea is basically to then compare to something like NFW. So we know that basically halos have a near universal density profile. And we want to understand how a parameterization found by the neural network compares to something like NFW. And what we're finding is that, for example, the algorithm is able to discover universality in the sense that it can predict using the same parameters, the density profile of a very large wide range of halos, and that this parameterization works better than NFW. 
So it kind of started off as like a test case to see whether this compression technique worked. And then it turned out to be interesting when comparing to known parameterizations like NFW and NASTO, because with the same number of parameters, you can basically describe a universal, a universal density profile better, in particular in the outer profile of halos, which are shaped by um, more like mergers and, and these kinds of things where NFW fails. Um, and so that, that's the sort of interpretations where, that we're gaining in this setting. But it's true that it sort of started off as a test case because we wanted to have a setting where we knew the exact parameterization or a good parameterization like NFW. And then it actually turned out to be interesting because it gave something better for the same number of, of dimensions. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I was confused. So why do you need a VAE here? What's probabilistic about this? Yeah, so basically what we want, so the EV, VAE is here because we want to sample from this latent space. So if you don't sample, what you end up doing is that you have a latent space that is not general enough, but it gives you um, basically latent variables that are only relevant to those specific halo masses that, are, um, that you've been training with. But basically for interpretability, you need various um, constraints to the, this latent space. For example, independence and disentanglement, these are all uh, aspects of the latent space that you can impose via the loss function if, if you sample from it. Um, that actually helps with the interpretability. Right. So for example, one property is like having a latent space that is continuous. If you don't sample, if you don't have a prior over these latent, these latent variables, you can't impose that. So it's, it's part of the interpretability goal to be able to have a distribution there rather than um, sing, single predictions. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, in any case, I'm, I'm at my conclusion. So what I've shown you here is basically that we've been trying to develop deep learning frameworks that are interpretable in the sense that we can learn uh, about some of the physics that um, involves cosmological structure formation. So in particular, we've been working on the role of anisotropic information in the initial density field in establishing final halo masses. And we're now uh, trying to develop the sort of supervised variational encoder to try and extract new physical knowledge about cosmic structures. And I'm also working on other applications to other halo properties that, such as halo bias and, and halo profiles, and hopefully in the future also other cosmic su structures such as voids. And thank you very much. And we can carry on with questions if any. Thanks, uh, thanks Luisa uh, for the very nice talk. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, I, I guess I have a question. So yeah. for the, um, I guess for the first part of your talk, when you're talking about the prediction of halo mass for the initial conditions, your network just predicts one, just like a point estimate, right, for the halo mass. Yeah. Have you tried looking at trying to predict like a distribution of possible halo masses? Yeah, so no, we haven't done that. So you mean something like normalizing flows or? Oh, like, yeah, I, I, I think at the, like the lowest possible level, right, would be a prediction of halo mass and like an uncertainty on halo mass. I was, you know, the more mm -hmm. advanced thing could be something like using a like a Gaussian mixture model prediction where it predicts like some superposition of various Gaussians at different values um, to represent the posterior. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we haven't tried that in, in this, in this um, setting. I think mainly because we were comparing to, for example, analytic models that also make point estimate predictions about mm -hmm. halo masses or
So we didn't set up in this way, but but I agree that it would be interesting to, you know, always include an un, some sort of uncertainty in in the deep learning problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the reason why I kind of bring it up is it seems like your kind of posterior estimates for those different mass spins have a really strong like regression to the mean effect where it looks like it's all everything's kind of like particularly on either extreme is very much pushed towards the mean yeah. value. And I think that's yeah. probably just completely a a artifact of the fact that like, you have like limited mass range that you're training over. Um, and so by including an uncertainty term, maybe that would mitigate that effect. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a general thing about neural networks, right? They're not great at extrapolating beyond the training set. Yeah. Or so even this, on the edges of the training set. Or <laughs> even on the edges, exactly. So this is actually one of the reasons why we adopted the Cauchy likelihood is because it was much better at actually capturing these tails mm-hmm. uh, in the posterior di- distributions, and they actually improved very much compared to um, assuming a Gaussian likelihood. But yes, I agree that there is some effect there in in that could be captured by an uncertainty on on the mass values. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, I had another question. So uh, can you go back to your uh, example where you're trained with a nonlinear density field? Yeah. This one, right? Yes. Um, so I was just wondering if the scatter there that you see, the arrow bar, how it comp- I mean, at, at some level, the mass of the individual halo is not per- perfectly defined. It would depend a little bit on what's your halo finding thing that you use yeah. as the truth. So how how does that error bar that you're getting there compare with the um, ill-definedness of the, of the actual mass of the halos, do you know? Yeah, so... In this case, I mean, the, the neural network basically only knows one halo finder definition, right? So to the neural network, there's one uh, definition of halo, which is what we use as the halo finder. So we tried different halo finders and we got similar predictions for the initial conditions case. In this case, these, these you mean these like long tails that are- I just here. meant that you like, look at the width of your prediction does, is this of the same size as the difference that you would get if I run this halo finder versus this other halo finder, or you're mm-hmm. paying a price for doing this as opposed to? So, so I don't think this this the 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 error here has has an it's it's the halo finder has an impact on that. I think these are actually, you know, within, within these bin, bins, these are very minimal errors. Um, and these long tails here are just outliers in, in the predictions. But I think that if you basically read on this exercise with the different halo finders, you would get exactly the same um, distributions here. Is Zach uh, want to ask? Yeah, thanks. Uh, sort of a similar question to the last two, but uh, relating to, to this slide and then the previous slide that had the um, similar plot where instead of doing the present day field, you did the initial condition. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious, uh, maybe you mentioned this, how, um, how you interpret the fact that when you feed your network the initial condition versus the present day field that the the scatter is so much larger um like is there some sort of underlying mechanism that uh <laughs> there's some so there's some information that just can't be accessed or, or or what what's your interpretation of that right yeah that's that's exactly right so in this present day density field i mean all the information is again like you can think of the CNN as just learning the algorithm of the halo finder, right, to predict the mass. Whereas in the initial conditions, what it's trying to do is to um, retrieve the information context from the linear density field to predict 
one nonlinear property of the halos, which is the mass. And so what it's missing there is basically all the gravitational evolutions that leads to the final halo mass, right? So it's just basically learning an effective mapping between initial conditions and halo mass, but it knows nothing about all the, the, the gravitational evolution that leads to that mass. So that's why the, the, the information contact in the initial conditions is so much lower than that at redshift zero, right? Because all it's learning is basically spherical averages over the position of the particle and neglects everything that happens later uh, in, the time, in the time evolution. So could that kind of be seen more as like a limitation of the particular CNN architecture you're using as opposed to something kind of fundamental? I'm just thinking that there are some works who were able to, like, I know at the, was it Yin Lee's work at the CCA, he was able to like, mm -hmm. make a CNN to just do the gravitational evolution from initial conditions to late time. Right, control. but I mean, that, that's a bit different, right? Because they were taking the whole field and were predicting at every voxel, at every voxel, the new field, um, from to LPT to nonlinear or something like that. That's a different problem than asking what is the information around around a given dark matter particle to predict just halo mass. So it's not that there's a limitation in the network's capability. It's just that it's extracting the information that there is in the initial conditions about halo mass, and that turns out to be spherical averages over. Uh, the particle's position. Do you see what I mean? It it doesn't mean that gravitation collapse is not anisotropic. Of course, it, of course it is, right? But we're only training it to learn what patterns can you find that are relevant to halo mass. So it's just a different um, learning task. Uh, I guess I'm like I'm thinking that like if you were to say plug in Yin Li's network onto your initial condition boxes as you have them here, would you not just get the final initial condition or final the final field, the z equals zero field, and then apply your network from the next slide and get a similar result or? Right, but what would you learn about the physics of structure formation from that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, know, right. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's the point, I think, that you can construct these neural networks in different ways, depending on what your aim is. So of course, if you want to get very good accuracy going from to LPT to N body, then you wouldn't set it up in this way because again, you're only extracting whatever there is that can tell you about halo mass about a central point in that box. Again, it's just a very different, yeah, learning nice. task, yeah. And then I guess another question is how big are the boxes you're using for the initial condition inputs? For so these inputs are basically sub boxes of, of the whole simulation, and these are 15 megaparsecs over H in length. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there could be some like yeah. super so, mode so we, type we effect test, that could be going on. Right. So we we tested this in, in many different ways, like first just by increasing the size of the sub boxes to see whether the predictions would change. And it got to a point where the information was just saturated. That increase in the box size wouldn't make any difference. We also trained on not the initial density field, but the gravitational potential, which includes you know, the larger scale modes within the input sub box to see whether there could be some large scale effects that we're not capturing in this inputs here and that also turned out to give exactly the same prediction. So I think the size of the sub boxes are pretty robust. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, are there other questions for Luisa? Uh, yes, we have one more. Is it maybe possible that by um, um, constructing the density field, which you're learning on, um, you lose small-scale information? Um, so 
the 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 size of the grid basically in this input sub box is exactly the grid size of the simulations so right. at the small scale level we're we're safe because we are using the actual grid size of the simulation not really right the the displacement field would have more information now sorry wouldn't the displacement field have more information i mean you you basically just have a binary right in which box your know, particle falls but the exact distance by which it moves um it's not included so the displacement field and the density field will be there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the two so it would make no no difference in terms of information content in one versus the other in the initial conditions they're, they're exactly the same you can derive one from the other, right? In the nonlinear field, you can have different realizations of one versus the other, but in the initial conditions, it's the same. Well, I mean, the density field is it's just a number of particles in a voxel, right? But uh, I don't really know by how far a particle has moved. How what, sorry? How far from you know, it's grid point the particle has moved. Oh, but the, but that is captured in the density field. So it, it's it depends how you compute the density field, I guess. But what we're doing here is some basically SPH smoothing around the n. I think it's thirty two nearest particles in the initial conditions. So then, for every particle, you have a density field. And then you can translate that to the grid size of your input box. Okay. Yeah. So you can compute basically a density for every particle and then translate that into a grid, into a linear grid. Yeah. Okay. Uniform grid. Yeah. Do you know if the error that you're making in this prediction? Um, is related at all on which particle you are looking at, meaning perhaps the ones that are in the outskirts of the yeah. region that just have fallen or something like that are worse yeah. than somebody else or something? Yeah, that's definitely true. So we find that the innermost particles, so in the, in the inner region of the halos, have a much better predictions than particles in the outskirts. So yes, in the paper we have, um, you know, plots showing the distinctions between inner particles and outer particles. And there is a difference in the predictions there, yeah. But, but we find that anisotropic information is not relevant for all these different classes of particles. So we, we tested it for, you know, inner particles, outskirts particles, low mass halos, high mass halos, and, and, and different categories like that. And if you were to combine the predictions that you make from all the particles in the halo, uh, would this be, be, be very, is this just because you're sent, is part of the scatter just because you're picking one particle only? Or... Um, what do you mean, sorry? So, so here you're taking one particle and getting from that particle only, you're trying to get the information of the mass of the entire halo. But imagine that you did this for all the particles that are in this halo, for each of them, and you average that or some, you combine it in some way. Maybe it's much better than this. So you're saying in, in some way inform the CNN that all these particles end up in the same halo? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that also defeats the point a bit of, of learning from the CNN, right? Because in principle, what you would want to do is make uh, predictions for every point in the density field without knowing a priori where those particles will end up, right? In that way, you would have to sort of know already what halos they end up in in order to tell it to the CNN, even, even at testing stage. So it's a little, so it's it's cheating a bit, I think. 